So our session today is um, just this window there. Embedded software reimagined. And we're going to talk about thread processors implemented using RISC-V. Now, Russ and I both work for Mentor, which is a part of Siemens. We're gradually transitioning uh, our, our business um, uh, front, 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 um, front window. So that will change before long. You can see on the screen our contact details if you want to get to us after today. And um, if you are interested, there is a blog, the address is at the bottom of the screen here, where I will talk about embedded software or whatever else is on my mind. So today's session, so I'm going to start off and hand over to Russ a little bit later. And what we're talking about today is not a product, not something we're trying to sell you. We're talking about a concept, a concept that uh, we've been talking about ourselves and we wanted to share it and um, hopefully get some, some inputs and some ideas. So we start out with a couple of observations. Over the last um, couple of decades, really, maybe even longer, software teams have been getting larger and larger at a significant rate faster than hardware teams. So the ratio of software to hardware team size can be three to one, up to 10 to one, anywhere on the spectrum, really. But ironically, the design of systems is still somewhat hardware driven, even though the software is a larger amount of the work that's involved. So that's one observation. Another observation is that FPGAs are getting bigger and faster and cheaper and they're increasingly being adopted by system designers in various kinds of systems. At the same time, ASICs are, are becoming easier, faster and cheaper to create than they were in the past. So a lot of things are changing, mainly in the direction of complexity. Now, there are other factors. Um, if we look at what systems need to do, they typically might need to be hard real time. So they need to be uh, responsive uh, in a 100% predictable way. They often need to be fast as well. And real time doesn't mean fast. Hard real time tends to mean fast. There are high reliability systems, systems which must not crash and do not necessarily need rebooting very often. There's safety and security. Safety is protecting the world from the device and security is protecting the device from the world. These are paramount in multiple industries. We think about avionics and automotive, but um, this is true in, in industry and um, industrial systems and medical systems as well, of course. These are all very important issues. Add to that, we have an increasing need for higher performance from devices. We have lower power consumption requirements and cost always needs to be coming down. So all of these issues are things that are facing embedded software developers, embedded de designers generally. Now, one of the responses to this is if we look at microprocessor architectures. Microprocessors have now existed for half a century. Um, so 50 years of development, what's happened in that time? Um, I've observed the last 40 years or so of it and uh, it's pretty clear things are becoming more complex. Instruction sets are more complex as complex designs of caches, pipelines to improve performance, interrupt structures can be incredibly complex in order to enable devices to respond to the outside world in, in a rational way. Memory management is there to help protect software and that's where the safety and security comes in quite often. And processors can have numerous modes and states. It's all very, very complicated. But we have clever people out there and they build systems and that's great. But why this complexity? Why are they so, why are systems, why are devices so com complex? Well, one reason is the designers of processors tend to ask software engineers what they need. And that seems a perfectly reasonable question. The answer they get is they need something, they want to run their sophisticated real-time operating system, or maybe even embedded Linux. They want something to run that on. And that's what they get. The problem is, that was the wrong question. The question that they should have been asking is, what do you actually want to do? Which is a subtly different question, because software developers have a preconception of what they will run their software on, 
Um, therefore, that's what they respond with. But what they really want to do is to run their software. And what they want to do is use their um, multi-threaded model, which uh, they use their real-time operating system. And what we really need is a hardware design methodology that reflects that software implementation. Now, what I'm not saying here is let software engineers design hardware. Um, I have been on a three-day VHDL course, so I'm fully qualified in hardware design. Actually, I'm not. The main thing I learned in three days is there's a lot more to designing hardware than coding a few lines of VHDL or Verilog, but it was interesting to have a, have a go at. I'm a software engineer, I'm staying there. I'll leave hardware design to other cleverer people than me. What we do need to do is say, not let software engineers design it, but we need to understand what software designers are really trying to achieve and use hardware design techniques to make it better or even feasible for things we can't currently do. The solution that we want to talk about is the concept of a thread processor. The idea is very simple at a certain level. We have a multitasking application. You've written it as if you have a real time operating system. What we're suggesting is that we simply give each task its own dedicated CPU, probably with its own memory. All these processors will be running simultaneously, uh, which is what we simulate with, a, with an operating system, but they will actually be running simultaneously. Um, but the API that you program to looks just like an ATOS. So to send a message to another task, you'll send it in a queue or something of that nature, or a mailbox or whatever. This architecture would provide 100% predictability because all the third processors have the same clock, or they could have the same clock. Uh, it's quite likely they would. So running in lockstep, which means that you know exactly what the temporal state of the entire system is. And each third processor has its own memory space or can have its own memory space, which gives it a, 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 a protection from all the other third processors. If we look at what having multiple cores does to performance, then just the, the example numbers here are silly, and thus we'll come back to this in more detail later. But imagine 10 tasks running under an RTOS on a 100 megahertz CPU. We could have them running at 10 megahertz on third processors that will save power. It's imperfect in some ways, but we have no RTOS overhead, we're saving power, which is a real benefit. Now, what would a thread processor look like? Well, if we design one from scratch, um, I haven't designed any CPUs this week, but uh, if, if I did, I might want to do some of these things. I might have a simple instruction set, I might not bother with interrupts, I wouldn't have any complicated modes and so forth, and I, would um, not have a complicated cache, and pipeline, etc. And I might optimize it for FPGA or, or ASIC design. But those are all the kinds of things I might do. And we'd also need to design some connection hardware, some plumbing to connect things. You know, I, I use the word pipe, but I mean, what I mean is a hardware implementation of mailboxes, queues, all those kinds of things that connect tasks together in a real time operating system. We need to connect the thread processors together. So what would a system look like in general terms? Well, we would have a third processor, TP, and it would have some memory. And we might have another one. And these might in turn be connected to a third one. And that in turn might be connected to another couple. And these two are actually sharing memory, which is an entirely uh, possible way of doing things. Uh, and these are all connected to another couple of web processors, which are connected to the outside world. And uh, on the left hand side here, we'll have some more web processors, each with their own memory, and they're connected to the outside world as well. So this looks very much like a diagram that you might draw if you're designing a multi threaded application in software, where you would simply draw a diagram to show how the tasks are connected together and, and uh, define their functionality. Let's consider an example, solving a, a problem of some kind. This is a, a, something which Russ will do in much more detail later for a, a different example, but this is a very simple one just to, to get you started. So imagine we have a secure data stream. We have data coming in on the left-hand side of our screen, and it's 
uh, encrypted in some way. So the first task decompresses the incoming data stream. The second task uh, does decryption. And the third one formats it into a form that makes sense for the rest of the application. That seems pretty straightforward. Where would we find problems with this if we we're implementing this in the real-time operating system? Well, probably the most obvious one will be the middle here. Decryption is going to be the bottleneck. This is where we would need a fair amount of computing power to do the decryption. With a real-time operating system, we would address that by making sure that task two gets plenty of CPU time. And we would probably do that by increasing its priority. But then we have to be careful because the rest of the system um, needs CPU time as well. So we need to get that balance just right. That's one of the challenges. What if we built this using thread processors instead? Well, it would look like this. The diagram is almost exactly the same, of course. We have three thread processors doing the same functionality, passing data between one another in what appears to be exactly the same fashion. And we still have the issue that the decryption uh, algorithm in the middle is the one that needs the load. So how will we deal with the fact that that requires more power? Well, the first thing we might do is we might simply put a more powerful thread processor in there. Um, that's a simple option. Um, another way we could approach it is have two thread processors both working on the job. Um, and have some means of arbitrating which one does which, which uh, each time. So the decompression thread processor may just alternately pass data to each of the two decryption thread processors. That would work reasonably well. And this would never work in an RTOS context because if you had two tasks sharing work, well, there's only a finite amount of, of CPU time. So splitting it into two tasks actually slows the job down because you've got more um, an overhead on the processor. So but the two thread processors are running in parallel simultaneously and they can deliver more performance than one can in the way you'd expect. We still may find that we have a problem here and we would find that probably at simulation time, long before we tried to run this on any real hardware, we would run it on a simulator and we could see that maybe the thread processors weren't keeping up as much as we might like. So, I'll skip that slide. So, we had the option of replacing them with some dedicated hardware IP. And we can do that very early in the design cycle as soon as we spotted a bottleneck. Now, this is relatively straightforward to do. I can say that because I haven't designed the IP. But the thread processors have basically a pinout. They all look the same. So we know exactly what this piece of IP needs to look at, look, look like in terms of its inputs and outputs. So we can define a standard for the way such IP would be created. So it would be reasonably straightforward. So, as I said, the pinout is well defined and we may well end up with a whole library of specialized um, hardwired thread processors in, in thinking of being. We may have a number of thread processor architectures at our fingertips. Um, the examples here are all with five um, architectures, uh, which come in different flavors depending on our particular needs. As I say, Russ is going to look at this in some more detail later in this session. We could uh, visualize thread processors being scalable according to the demands of the software. So we can decide how much power a given thread processor needs and select the CPU or configure the CPU in an appropriate fashion. Something else we can do, which we're not going to delve into today particularly, is non-intrusive debug. Because when you're at the debug phase, um, once you're putting it onto real hardware particularly, you may want to see what's going on. And that's a problem in general, because as soon as you add extra tasks to do that with the real-time operating system, you interfere with the real-time performance. Their processors, no problem. We simply uh, uh, would instantiate one or more additional thread processors to do debugging. They wouldn't be stealing anything from anyone else and you could see in real time what's going on. So that's quite an exciting possibility and not one we've explored particularly yet, but it's the kinds of things that we visualize being appropriate going forward. 
I have reached the end just about of my uh, my little slot and um, I'm going to hand over to Russ in a moment who's going to go through more detail and example design using thread processors and hopefully you're all set up there Russ and I'm going to stop screen sharing so all right. me, there we go All right, is uh, that appropriately shared? Yes, looking good. Excellent. All right, good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Um, I'm Russ Klein, a colleague of Collins, and I'm going to be talking today about uh, taking this concept of a thread processor and putting it into uh, an example design. Um, so we had talked about this concept uh, over dinner uh, back at the Embedded World Conference a while ago, and uh, Colin mused about how this might work. And um, I am a hardware designer, and I thought, well, we could actually create one of these and see how does it really work. And um, I've, I've sort of had the notion for a long time that uh, a group of simple CPUs can outperform uh, one really big complicated one. And I thought, well, here's an interesting uh, concept and perhaps we can, um, you know, take a look at what happens when we take uh, a number of small, simple CPUs and assemble them together uh, to take on uh, a realistic task. And what are the characteristics of it and how hard would it be to design? Um, so what we're gonna do is take this thread processor concept and apply it to uh, the design of a garage door opener. And so this is a typical uh, smart IoT device of the 21st century. Um, so it's gonna be connected to the internet and it's going to have some AI embedded in it. Um, so it's gonna perform a bunch of different functions. So obviously it's going to open and close the garage door and people will be able to request that from uh, a push button, which is on the wall inside the garage, through a remote control uh, that you would have in your car or on your keychain, uh, or through the internet. We could have an app that would run on a phone or a computer where we could look at the status of the garage door and tell it to open or to close. Now, we do need to worry about uh, a crushing hazard, right? So a garage door is a, a piece of machinery that's got a motor in it that's probably got three quarters of a horsepower or more. Uh, moving uh, an item that potentially could come into contact with people or animals or things and it can crush them. So we do have a safety concern here uh, that we need to worry about. So anybody who's programming or building one of these, it needs to take that to account. Uh, this thing, because it's an IoT device, will be connected to the internet and you can run an app on your smartphone and take a look at what's going on. Uh, and we also have security concerns. Um, in America, a garage door acts as a lock to your house. Somebody can get through the garage door, they can off often uh, enter. Um, we didn't really have enough time to go into the safety and security concerns. We're gonna talk more about the implementation and performance and things like that. Um, but perhaps next year we'll come back and talk about safety and security because I think there's some really interesting um, uh, discussions that we had around that with the notion of the threat processor. So on our imaginary product here, we're going to have uh, four functions that the system is going to perform. Um, and each one of these is going to be built into a thread. So we've got the open-close function, uh, the most basic function of the garage door opener. Um, this is very low compute complexity, and it is not real time, right? I hit the, I, I press the button or hit the remote. I want the door to open eventually, but if it takes 10 milliseconds or 500 milliseconds, it really doesn't matter. Um, the next task will be to reverse or stop when an obstruction is, is um, encountered. Um, this is also low compute complexity. It's got a, a very simple set of mechanisms to figure out, is the door being obstructed? 
Um, but it is real time and there is a safety concern here and it is life critical. So this is something that you have to get right. Um, the third task is one where it will communicate with the internet. So we'll have a, a Wi-Fi stack and um, a server that will be able to report uh, the status of the garage door and uh, perform operations on the system. Um, so this is high compute complexity, but it's also not real time. And finally, um, because every system needs AI on it, um, this is going to listen for somebody yelling the word stop. Um, so within the garage, somebody can yell stop and the garage door will stop in its tracks. And so this is high compute complexity. It's going to be using a convolutional neural network to achieve this. Um, this is real time. And there are, again, safety concerns. And those safety concerns are life critical. Um, so I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about each of these functions. And then we'll go on to uh, their implementation on thread processors. So the open and close thread is pretty simple. It's going to be waiting for a command. And the command could be either a push button activation, uh, a remote control activation, or a request received from the internet. What it's going to do is look to see where is the door presently. Uh, it'll set the motor direction to open or close as appropriate. Uh, it'll start the motor. It'll wait for an indication that it's reached its endpoint. And then it'll turn off the motor and then this thread goes to sleep and waits for uh, the next command to come in. Reverse one obstructed, um, also a very simple uh, thread. Uh, it's gonna wait for the motor to start running. And when the motor starts running, it's gonna do two things. It's basically going to read uh, a current draw register. So we've got a, uh, an ammeter connected to our motor. Uh, and that is going to record the current draw. It's going to put that in a register that's available to our processor. Um, and if that current draw goes over a certain threshold, we'll know that the motor is working harder than it should be to open or close the door and deduce that indeed there's some sort of a destruction. So if that happens, we're going to reverse the motor, sound an alarm so people pay attention, flash the lights, and then stop the motor after a quarter of a second. Next thing we're going to do is read an electric eye. So there'll be a, a, a light beam across uh, the bottom of the door. And if a person or an object is obstructing the door, uh, it can observe that. And likewise, it will do the same behavior to back up the door. And this is a task that we're going to repeat every millisecond uh, while the motor is running. So communicating with the internet on boot, we're going to establish a Wi-Fi connection. Um, and this will respond to requests for information, the door location, the motor status, what version of software we have. Um, and that can be connected to an app on the cell phones. Um, it can respond to requests for open and close operations. Uh, it should not respond to unauthorized requests. And at points in time, it should load some firmware updates, uh, but indeed never load unauthorized code. And finally, and probably the most interesting, is uh, listening for the word stop. So there will be a microphone uh, in the unit which brings in audio from the garage area. And what we're gonna do is run a keyword detection convolutional neural network. So much like when you say, hey Siri or hey Google or Alexa, um, it's going to recognize that somebody has said this keyword um, and we've trained this to detect the word stop. Um, incidentally, we could train it to recognize the word stop in 20 different languages. You could advertise that as, a, as a yet a further safety feature. Now, if the word stop is heard, again, it's going to reverse the motor direction, sound the alarm, flash some lights, and stop the motor. And this is a task that we want to repeat every 20 milliseconds while the motor is running. And the requirement from uh, our imaginary bosses says that the door is required to stop within 50 milliseconds of the command being voiced. So how would we go about putting this um, into a system using traditional programming paradigms? Um, and we've got some hard real-time requirements and we've got some safety critical operations. So we're going to need a real-time operating system. 
And so within the real-time operating system, we'd sit down and we'd say, well, um, we've got a priority to these tasks. So obviously number one is gonna be to reverse that instruction. Right, it's the most basic way of protecting people and property that get in the way of the door. Uh, that's our top priority, and we want to make sure that um, that can run every millisecond, almost no matter what else is going on in the system. Um, the second one, which is also real time and safety critical, is listening for the stop. And so this is going to run every 20 milliseconds. So we've got a little bit of a problem here in that we have both tasks one and two and they really need to run concurrently. So the real-time operating system is gonna to have to switch between these. But even while tasks one and two are running, we don't want to completely ignore tasks three and four. Um, certainly if the door's in the middle of moving and we hit the button again, we want something to happen. So uh, those have to get some time as well. Um, and so this is a, a, a realistic yet complicated challenge for a real-time operating system to juggle all of these different tasks and make sure that it can meet the real-time requirements for tasks one and two, uh, but still not absorb, uh, ignoring tasks three and four. And so it's the job of the RTOS and the, and the person programming the RTOS to figure out how do we distribute the time appropriately uh, based on what conditions are taking place. And, and really challenging is how do we ensure that the real-time constraints are met. That the, in the worst case, we're still gonna do stop the door when somebody yells stop within 50 milliseconds, and that we reverse on an obstruction within the time limit required there. Now, the, we've talked a little bit about these challenging, uh, challenges, but the RTOS needs to have enough flexibility to divvy out different time slices to these different threads. Um, effectively doing context switches. This means we're probably going to have to have a machine mode, a supervisor mode, and a user mode. Um, and we're going to have to be able to context switch between these in a way that gives us a deterministic response to our real-time events. Um, so the CPU is going to have to be designed, it's going to have to have a lot of machinery to be able to quickly switch these tasks in and out um, get them all to effectively make some progress toward their endpoint concurrently and meet their time goals. Um, and uh, we're going to have to have multi-level interrupt mechanisms because the interrupts will come into the RTOS. The RTOS will need to distribute those. And the software developer needs to figure out how to uh, cause the RTOS to affect all of these things uh, correctly throughout the system. And so we, we just need to make sure those two high priority tasks get run and um, that none of the others are starved and that it's deterministic and we meet our timing goals. Um, initially, when I looked at this, I thought we were gonna be running the Wi-Fi stack uh, on top of a Linux environment. Um, we ultimately found a Wi-Fi stack that runs on a real-time operating system. So we ended up using that. But if we had Linux, um, we probably would need to bring a hypervisor to the party. Um, the hypervisor would then host the real-time operating system and uh, the Linux partition. Um, and we'd probably want to have dynamic load balancing for our hypervisor, right? So while the door is moving, we'd really want to uh, heavily weight the real-time side and lightly weight the Linux side. So we want to give most of the processor time uh, to the RTOS partition while the door's moving. But when the door's not moving, we want to give most of the time to the Linux side. If we had a fixed partitioning, we'd essentially have to get a processor that ran twice as fast in order to make sure that we could meet our requirements. So it's, it's getting, it gets to a point where you have a bigger and bigger processor. Now, bringing in a hypervisor means we're going to need hardware support for an additional operating mode. We're going to need a machine mode. We're going to need a hypervisor mode. Uh, we're then going to need uh, uh, a, a supervisor mode and then a user mode. So you have one level um, of one additional operating mode for the hypervisor to live in. And this is going to add both hardware and software overhead. And it does make it even more challenging to determine, you know, what is the worst case timing from somebody yelling stop to the door actually stopping. 
right? There's yet one more bit of uh, hardware and software that gets in the way before that particular thread um, can perform its task. Now, if we look at implementing this on a thread processor, it becomes you know, fairly simple, right? Each thread gets implemented on its own processor, and each processor has its own local memory for code and data. Now, we are going to need to get at some common peripherals and some, some common registers uh, within the system. So uh, I did end up putting a system bus together uh, that each of the thread processors could access. And, and what I did was set it up so we had uh, an, an address which was in high memory, it would go to the system bus. If it was in low memory, it would go to uh, the local code and data space. Now, what happened was, um, where in a typical system, you would make sure that your system interconnect could handle um, the biggest uh, transfer loads that were necessary, and you sort of spread that across all your peripherals. Here, the system bus is very lightly loaded. And so instead of needing a, a very complicated cache coherent AXI or type interconnect or you know, very high end tile link, um, this could be a very simple system bus. Um, and it doesn't even have to be particularly wide. What we did observe, and I'll talk about some area numbers later on, is that as we went to, um, uh, from a traditional processor to a thread processor, um, what we found is that the interconnect got lighter and lighter, and there's actually a fair amount of area dedicated to interconnect in traditional systems. <clears throat> so let's look at implementing each of these on a thread processor, and we'll start with the easy ones. Um, so our open and closed task, um, this is a very low compute complexity. Uh, and it has no real-time requirement. We implemented this using uh, a RISC-V 32E core, which is really the, the smallest, simplest one that you can get. Um, it had machine mode only, um, and we paired it up with 4K bytes of code and data memory. And it turned out that when we programmed, when we compiled up <clears throat> the open and close routine, um, the total size of the image, including the C runtime library initialization, was only 1,624 bytes. And so that's our code space, and we reserved the rest for the stack. Um, in this case, we used the IBEX processor, which is, I had actually used on some earlier projects, so I had it and understood it. So shout out to the low risk team and the folks at ETH Zurich who put that together. Um, the IBEX core is, um, uh, a very simple processor. It's got two uh, pipeline stages and is extremely area and power efficient. Um, and so this made for a, a nice little concise block of hardware uh, that could perform this open and close function. Uh, stop on obstruction, also very low complexity. Um, here, the program ended up being a little bit bigger, 2,600 bytes, but we still could fit uh, that program and all of its uh, stack area in 4K bytes of memory that intermingled the code and data. Um, and we used the same IBEX uh, configured as an RV32E. Uh, so no multiplier, no floating point, uh, just 16 registers, um, a, a really a nice concise block of hardware to perform this operation. The Wi-Fi protocol stack gets a little bit more complicated. Um, this is, I, I said high complexity, it's really medium complexity, um, but it does not have a real-time requirement. Here we went with a RISC-V 32G, um, and we had 128K of code space and 128K of data memory. So we found a Wi-Fi stack that runs on top of free RTOS. Uh, free RTOS uh, minimally configured because we were only having one thread here um, and we were able to strip out a, a number of options. Uh, it, was, it was pretty easy to configure and we got it down to about 10K of code space. Um, the TCP IP stack and libraries that come with it uh, is about 40K and then the uh, open source Wi-Fi protocol stack is about 35K. And so more than 64K, but less than 128. So we went with 128K of memory, uh, an equal size data memory. I didn't spend a lot of time uh, sizing that. We probably could have gone a little bit lower. Um, 
Uh, but again, this became a, a fairly small block of hardware uh, within the system. And so the, the last task is to listen for the word stop. And so here, um, there are a bunch of wake word algorithms that are available uh, as open source. And so we were looking for something relatively small, light in terms of compute complexity, um, and also convolutional neural networks can have very large weight and bias databases. And we wanted to kind of minimize that to minimize the, um, uh, the memory area that would be taken up. And so uh, we ended up going with one that was presented at Interspeech 2015. Um, and it was from a paper called Convolutional Neural Networks for Small Footprint Keyword Spotting. And the name of the algorithm is CNN1 FStride 4. Um, and so it was, it was actually one of the smallest ones that I had found a couple of years ago working on a project to uh, implement a neural network system. And so I reused this. Um, I actually did some looking around recently, and it turns out that the state of the art has advanced, and there are some smaller uh, wake word algorithms available now that we could use. But uh, this represents a fairly large computational load um, and again, it does have that real-time requirement. Um, so what this is going to do is run every 20 milliseconds, and it's going to process one second of captured audio data, and it's going to try and look for that one second of audio data and see, uh, does it hear the word stop within it at all? Now, before we get to our neural network, we need to do a little bit of audio pre-processing. So we've got a task which will take uh, input from a microphone, which gives us our, our audio data, and this would be analog. And the first thing we want to do is quantize it. So we want to um, turn it from that analog waveform into an array of integers of 16 bits, which are going to be um, positive to negative numbers. And for one second of data, we're going to take 16,000 um, <clears throat> 16, uh, sample points. And this is going to get passed to a function called a MEL frequency sepstral coefficient function. And what this is going to do is basically look at the spectral energy at different frequencies that are particularly, um, uh, that humans can hear particularly well. So it's going to uh, look at those different frequencies and record the energy. Uh, at different levels uh, over our one second time interval. And this is going to give us a spectral array. And this is a visualization of one of those. And so we've got uh, a number of different frequencies from low frequency to high frequency, and then the energy in each of those uh, frequencies. And so this is really <clears throat> just a big array of floating point numbers. It's 128 by 40 um, by 32 bits. And so this array becomes our input to our neural network uh, as a feature map for both the training and the inferencing. Now, this MEL frequency uh, sexual coefficient function uh, is actually uh, very uh, complex. Um, in it, it's got a fast Fourier transform uh, that within it has a discrete cosine transform. And it does a lot of floating point math with trigonometric functions. And uh, it turned out that just running this MFCC function on the input data, um, our, our initial cut at it, it exceeded our 20 millisecond time frame on most of the risk processors we were looking at, risk five processors we were looking at. Um, so what we ended up doing was going into um, the, the trigonometric functions and setting them up as lookup tables. So, for sine and cosine, we created a 512 entry lookup table. So computing those values, um, we had sort of a sloppy computation, if you will, but it was simply a single memory lookup and the table for both of them um, uh, took up 4K of, of memory space. So relatively uh, small area that we could just put into memory to be able to quickly look things up. And this sped the uh, this computation up rather significantly, but it's still, uh, even with that, the fast Fourier transform uh, still takes quite a bit of time. So this is a, a non-trivial amount of processing before we even get to our neural network. 
Um, this is what our wake word neural network looks like. So we've got uh, one second of audio data um, that's going to be coming in, and uh, it's going to be broken up into 186 channels um, in a 2D convolutional function uh, with where we add a bias. Uh, we then do a relu on that, and then it's passed through three matrix multiplies where in each level we add a bias again and then into a softmax, which gives our, us our interface. Now, what's notable here is that 89%, almost 90% of our computational load is in the 2D, con, the conf2D function, and about 78% of our IO transfer is going to be in this first matrix multiply. So those are kind of the really big targets that we look at in terms of uh, performance and data movement. Um, so our computational requirements for each inference, we're going to be doing a little over 7 million multiply accumulate operations, and we're going to have a million words or four megabytes of weight and bias data that we need to be transferred to our processor. Um, that's per inference. We're doing an inference every 20 milliseconds. So on a per second basis, this is 350 million multiply accumulate operations, and we're going to be consuming uh, a gigabyte uh, of bandwidth per second um, between the processor and the weight memory. So that gigabyte represents just uh, the computational requirements for the convolution. No other, um, uh, no other threads and no other computations included. So it means we've got to have a really uh, reasonably beefy um, interconnect built into the system. Um, our CPU is going to, just for the, this uh, convolution, is going to be right around uh, 700 MIPS, something in that range of CPU performance. Again, that doesn't take any of the other processing we need to do into account. Um, so this is going to require, so if we're going to pack all of this onto a single processor, uh, we're going to need a, a, re, a fairly high-end RISC-5 CPU. Um, in order to get the frequency up, we're probably going to need a few pipeline stages, and we're probably going to need to retire multiple instructions per second. Now, the vector extensions would really help with this problem because we're doing a lot of vector math. Uh, those weren't available yet, so we didn't use those. Um, and if we allow for an increased latency and we bring in multiple thread processors, as uh, Colin described earlier, um, uh, bringing in three thread processors will actually reduce that performance requirement from a gigahertz down to about 750 megahertz. Um, and ultimately, I'll show you a configuration with a pipeline. So the traditional implementation, we'd have uh, a, a big application processor. We would be running all of our threads. Uh, so we'd have our code and data memory, our weight and bias memory. Again, a gigabyte per second while we're inferencing is going to be going through that system interconnect. We'd have our system registers and our other uh, peripherals available. Um, so this is, this is going to require a pretty significant um, threat, uh, processor, application processor to bring to the party. Now, the thread processor we need for the interface, would we, we in fact ended up using a RISC-V 64G processor um, with the math coprocessors on board running at a gigahertz. <clears throat> the code space was um, amazingly small, I, uh, much smaller than I expected. It's just 32K. The convolution code is really uh, very small. Uh, most of this is the, the MEL frequency um, computation. 128K of data memory and our weight memory at uh, 4 megabytes. Now, the really neat thing about having this thread processor is that all of that heavy lifting on the I.O. between the weight memory and this thread processor uh, is uh, is done here locally. It's an unarbitrated bus and we can make it as wide as we want. Um, to support the, that data movement that we need, and it doesn't affect anything else within the system. And so this means that the complexity of our interconnect um, becomes much simpler, uh, and it becomes much faster as well, because we don't have to deal with any arbitration. Um, so this speeds, this, we, we get a significant benefit in the overall characteristics of the system by simply moving to a thread processor even though we still need to be running at about a gigahertz. Now, if <clears throat> we were to break this up into um, three processors, 
the logical organization would be to have a thread processor doing our uh, MEL frequency substrum calculation, uh, another processor doing our convolution, and a final processor doing the three fully connected layers in the soft max, so sort of the rest of the inferencing code. So in this case, well, we're going to use uh, three um, uh, RISC five. Actually, these were thirty-two uh, Gs, um, and run these at seven hundred and fifty megahertz. So these were rocket cores that we got from UC Berkeley, just the standard distribution of rocket cores. <clears throat> Again, a typo here. This, these were uh, RV thirty-two uh, IMFs, and uh, populated all of these. Uh, we're able to synthesize them at 750 megahertz. This weight memory is at uh, three megabytes, and this weight memory goes down to three quarters of a megabyte. Um, and then we split up the code memory appropriately across all of these. Our bandwidth, uh, so our weight memory bandwidth is taken up quite a bit, and there's also significant bandwidth here. So we've effectively tripled our uh, memory bandwidth. Uh, across this design by breaking it up into three processors. Now, if we want to look at how long will this take, um, broken up into three cores, um, since we have a, a 20 millisecond input requirement, uh, none of these threads can run longer than 20 milliseconds, but we can overlap their operation. So the slowest thing within this mix of functions is going to be our convolution. So we, if we set that at 20 milliseconds, which happens on uh, the RISC-5G at 750 megahertz, um, our MFCC will take 4 milliseconds, and our fully connected layers will take 2.7 milliseconds um, for an overall latency of 26.7 milliseconds. Now, imagine trying to figure out what your worst case throughput was while a real-time operating system is juggling all the other threads and looking at the you know stop on obstruction figuring out how long is the worst case would actually be really challenging here you can do it on a timeline or an excel spreadsheet it's really quite straightforward now the next obvious step is rather than just having one thread processor working on the convolution uh, as each one of these audio samples come in we could break it up into three different processors. And here we could extend uh, the convolution up to 37 milliseconds when combined with our MFCC <clears throat> and our fully connected layer, um, running this at 405 megahertz, uh, we exactly hit our 50 millisecond uh, latency time. So we're increasing the latency, but taking our frequency down quite significantly. Um, so this configuration would look like this. We've got uh, three thread processors. Um, they're going to share a common weight memory. They'll share a common code memory, but each have their own data uh, memory. Um, and the, the thread process for the MFCC and the fully connected layer um, remain the same. Um, so one of the questions you would have here is, should I use more processors? Or should I use bigger, faster processors? And there's an MIT professor who spent a lot of time thinking about this, a um, gentleman named Anat Agarwal. And uh, Anat Agarwal uh, did a lot of research into uh, multi-core and many-core designs. And he created this thing he called the kill rule. And the kill rule basically stated that if the increase in your processor size exceeds the performance increase, don't take the bigger processor, use more processors. And if the increase in the processor size is less than the increase in performance, go with the bigger processor. So for example, if you, if you go to the next beefier processor and it makes your thread go 50% faster, but takes up two times as much space, you're going to be better off power-wise and area-wise to use two of the smaller processors rather than the bigger one, because you get 100% more processing power instead of just 50% more processing power. Now, there's a proviso on this, excuse me, and, and that is this only makes sense if your second processor can be used in parallel with your first processor. 
So Anant Agarwal was uh, the founder and CEO of a company called Telera, which built many core CPUs, which while um, very technologically uh, advanced and successful, um, weren't a big commercial success, but uh, because the, the challenge was people didn't like to program um, in a multi-threaded environment. But with the thread processors, this becomes a, a bit easier as you can uh, sort of create the illusion that you're running in a traditional RTOS. Now, in addition to um, bringing processors in, as Colin mentioned, we could go beyond a processor and replace a particular, uh, particularly significant computational load with uh, a dedicated hardware function. This is gonna bring in much more parallelism, much higher throughput, and much lower latency. Uh, the downside, of course, is this is not gonna be able to be reprogrammed. So whatever you put into that hardware block is stuck in that hardware block. Um, it doesn't have the flexibility that CPU does, but it really is much faster, much lower power. Um, so in this case, what we did was created a hardware block which would perform that uh, 2D convolution, which is the really uh, big computational load in our inferencing environment. And we did this with four multipliers. Uh, I originally wanted to go with 16. It turned out that 16 was a waste because of, uh, if we looked at the overall throughput, and I'll show you the timeline of that in a couple of slides. Um, but we have four multipliers operating uh, on each clock that comes in. Um, and, so, and then in, in a pipeline, we perform the bias add and the relu. And so those are uh, pipeline operations. And so those effectively happen in the same clock as well. Now, if we looked at uh, the CPU that was running this, uh, it, the tight inner loop was, uh, took six clocks. So it would read in one operand, one factor, read in the other factor, um, it would then perform the multiplication, it would write out the result, it would increment counters, and then compare and branch back to the beginning. It'd be repeating that. And fully optimized, that was averaging about six clocks per loop iteration. And here we get four multiplies on every clock edge. So we get about a 24, a uh, factor of 24x over uh, using uh, software for this, which is a significant uh, performance improvement. Now, what we did was use uh, an approach called high-level synthesis, where we could take that C program and actually generate the hardware. Um, so even the software guy could do it. Um, what we did was, uh, what is high-level synthesis? Fun fundamentally, it is a compiler that will take a, um, that will take a C or C++ function and rather than compiling it up into a set of opcodes that's going to be executed on by a traditional CPU, it compiles it into synthesizable RTL. Um, and this then can be used by a bunch of automated downstream tools to actually be realized in hardware, either an ASIC or an FPGA. Um, now this uh, capability, um, when used by the casual user, somebody who doesn't understand all of the different hooks, um, typically, you're going to get somewhere between a tenfold increase and a 50-fold increase in, in overall performance. Experienced users, people who really understand high-level synthesis, are going to be able to get output um, that's as good as handcrafted RTL. But it does, there's a bit of a learning curve associated to get that level of result. Um, but in this case, 24x speed up is plenty. And in fact, if we sped it up any more, uh, it really wouldn't be uh, benefiting our overall throughput um, because the other computations and software would be limiting how fast we can go. Now within high-level synthesis, the user has a lot of control over uh, the design that gets built. <clears throat> so we can go for the most parallel design, fully unroll all the loops, try and do all of the C operations in parallel. And this is gonna create a very fast implementation of that function but it's gonna be huge um, and, and perhaps infeasibly huge. Um, we could also do, leave all of the loops, loops rolled up and we could simply um, you know, keep as compact a design as possible. This will end up being slow. Now it's still gonna be a lot faster than software and running a CPU, um, but it'll be slow relative to the other hardware options. 
And you can also do something in between. You can select the trade-off. Now, high-level synthesis tools are available from all the major EDA vendors and the FPGA vendors, so both Xilinx and Altera have high-level synthesis tools available, and they have design flows that will let you use them for acceleration. So it fits nicely in with this uh, uh, approach that we're describing. And there are even some open source versions of uh, high-level synthesis. Um, so our, for our convolution, um, one of the things we could have done was left that all of the loops fully rolled up. We would implement one multiplier in hardware. We'd get one multiplication per clock because we could do all of the loop accounting um, in parallel. Um, and so we'd have to have uh, in, ingress and egress paths for I.O. of two data values coming in and one result going out. Um, but that one multiplier would give us probably a 6x boost over what was being run in software. We could fully unroll the loop. Now, fully unrolled, we'd be doing 1,024 multiplications per clock. And this would require bringing in 2,048 values uh, as the factors. So we'd need a data bus that was 2048 times 32, or 64K bits of, of bus input, and then an equal amount for the output. And then I didn't include the biases here. So we'd have a total of 128,000 bits um, that we would be, need to be moving on a, on a clock. And this is just an infeasibly large uh, bus structure. The trade-off that we selected was to use four multipliers, which means we need to bring eight values in and four values out. Now, if we're gonna implement something in software on a RISC-V processor, um, it means that one of the things we need to do um, is to use the native data types, right? So we're gonna use 32 or 64-bit integers or floating point numbers. That's gonna be the most efficient and sensible thing to use for algorithms that are running in software. Now, if we're gonna build our own hardware, we can actually use any size numbers we want. And this is important because multipliers, which is gonna be the biggest area and power contributor to our overall computation here, they shrink in area by the square of the size of the input operands. So an eight bit multiplier is going to need 1 16th the area of a 32-bit multiplier. And also, we don't have to use floating point numbers or integers, we can use fixed point numbers. Um, and a fixed point multiplier is about half the size of the equivalent floating point number, uh, floating point multiplier. So this means we can get some really big savings if er in area and uh, power consumed, if we can shrink down uh, the, not the operands that we're using. So what we did was looked at uh, our uh, neural network and we, we ran a, a scan from 32-bit fixed point numbers all the way down to one-bit numbers and performed the computation and looked at the uh, percent accuracy of its ability to detect the word stop. Um, so with 32-bit fixed point representation, we got the same result as on a desktop machine running floating point numbers. And it turned out that that didn't budge at all until we got down to 12 bits. Actually, 11 bits is where it started to drop a little bit. But it was still in the high 90% range, even down at 10 bits. Now, 9, uh, it starts to drop down a bit more. And at 8, we're down to 90%. By the time we get down to 5, it's equivalent to random, so the, the, it's completely fallen apart. Uh, so the reality is we don't need a 32-bit multiplier. We actually could get away with a 10-bit multiplier or 12-bit multiplier, depending uh, how much resource we want to apply to it. Um, so we can quantize this neural network. Um, and in this case, uh, we took it down to 10 bits, represented as fixed point numbers, and this takes our bus FIFO size from needing to be 128 bits down to 40 bits. Um, so significant savings in area of the interconnect and very significant savings in the area of uh, the multiplier. So if we had four 32-bit multipliers, it'd be about 100,000 gate equivalents. 
our four 10-bit fixed point multipliers uh, were synthesized out at just 5.5 gate equivalents. So a really nice savings in terms of area by being able to just build exactly what we need. So this is what the, um, the thread processors around our infants look like with our convolution built into hardware. So we've got two processors now dedicated to the inference. Um, our thread processor running our MFCC and our thread processor running our fully connected layers and softmaps. And so here we've got RV32 IMFs and we can actually take this down from 405 megahertz to 177. Um, we eliminate code memory that would be associated with this. And very importantly, we also shrink down our weight memory for our hardware convolution from three quarters of a megabyte to a megabyte, a quarter megabyte. Um, so some significant area savings there as well. Now, if we look at the timeline, um, the convolution uh, after it was sped up ended up taking 4.2 milliseconds. So now we can pack the MFC, MFCCs back to back and have those take 20 milliseconds. We've got 4.2 milliseconds in our convolution and then our fully connected layer at 13 and a half milliseconds. That gives us 37 milliseconds, 0.7 milliseconds um, of latency instead of our 50, which is fine. Um, but had we, had we made the convolution go even faster, had we done 16 multipliers, it'd be down at one millisecond, but we'd still have uh, about 35 milliseconds of latency and we wouldn't be able to reduce the clock frequency anyway because we'd be gated by how fast we can run our MFCC computation. Um, so four multipliers worked just fine in this case. So pulling this all together, um, we would have our four uh, thread processing blocks, each working on a different part of the, we working on a different thread. Our listen for stop would be broken up further where we'd have two CPUs and a hardware block, uh, each having its own memory, which means all of the heavy lifting uh, between the computational units and the memory units is being done without arbitration um, and means that that bus connection could be much simpler and go faster. We do have a system interconnect where these blocks can talk to each other in our system register bank and our peripherals. But this system interconnect is going to be much lightly, much more lightly loaded than in a traditional system. Let's talk now a little bit about how we picked the different cores that we were running. And so how to pick a core um, there's a really big variety of RISC-V cores that you can pick from. And usually when you render them, uh, you're going to um, pick a bunch of different options. So if you have floating point, make sure that you're including uh, the F instruction set or the D, the double precision floating point uh, instructions. Um, if you're doing a lot of multiplication and division, you would want to bring in the, uh, the M instruction set. Um, if you're not, you'd want to exclude those. And uh, likewise, you're going to want to exclude all of the multi-threading capabilities, um, the supervisor and user modes, those really don't need to come in. Um, and anything else that might be, uh, you really want to include anything else that might be used. So you want to create a configuration that maxes out um, the particular uh, processor that you're looking at. And from there, you want to see how fast will it run on my algorithm. So you're going to take that processor, configure it, build it as RTL. You can run this on an FPGA or in a logic simulation. You could run it in the Verilator. And this will give you a clock cycle accurate representation of how fast does this CPU go with this algorithm. You can add unarbitrated memory to it. So you're going to get a realistic memory times. There will be no uh, other traffic on the bus, so that won't uh, confuse the calculations. But what you want to do is limit uh, the instruction sets that you build into the program using the architecture and ABI flags on GCC. And so these can control the M, the A, the D, the F, and the C instruction sets. You can include or exclude them with those uh, flags. Now, right now, the L, the B, the V instructions, et cetera, are not included in GCC. So to include or exclude those, you'd want to use libraries or uh, ASM directives in your C code to call those uh, instructions or not call them. And so 
given that you've got a processor that's got all of the functions, if you write a program that only takes advantage of a few of them, you can see how fast that would run. So you've got to build one uh, sort of benchmarking platform, compile the code a bunch of different times, and run it on them. Um, and bearing in mind that if you are able to throw out a bunch of things, you might get a slightly higher uh, Fmax, but your Fmax probably could be determined by the overall system. And so uh, this is a, a minor consideration. Um, and when you do build the final configuration for the system, uh, you'll want to build it just with those things that are actually built into your program. It's just one program dedicated to this one CPU. We can customize the heck out of it to get the most efficient implementation. Now, as for how to control those instructions, um, I was going to put a few slides in here with examples, but um, it, I found it really difficult and was having a lot of challenges with it until I stumbled across this blog entry uh, from Palmer over at sci -Fi. And so rather than me trying to explain exactly how to do it, I'm going to give you a pointer to his blog entry um, and go take a look at that. He does a really good job of describing how the ABIs are defined, how the architectures are defined, how GCC then links in the right libraries, so that you're able to do, for example, if you exclude the floating point instructions, it'll pull in software emulation of those floating point operations. If you exclude the multiplier, you'll get a software emulation of the multiply operations. And so um, the, the, the flags get a bit complicated. So I, I'd say um, go to this blog entry, read through it, and it should be able to explain everything that you need to know about being able to control exactly what image you build. So here's a couple of examples of uh, the functions that we've been talking about. And what we did was, um, you know, built an RV32 with basically everything in it, um, and then compiled the program with these different instruction sets. So our 2D convolution function, um, and this was not the full 2D convolution, but it was a, a, a stripped back benchmark program. Running it on an RV32E, uh, it was close to 200,000 clocks. When we compiled it for an I, which meant it wasn't used as 16 registers, but would use 32, uh, we got about a 25% speed up, which uh, is in the neighborhood of what you'd expect. Um, when we added the multiplier, um, multiply instructions, instead of emulating those in software, uh, it ran in 62,000 clocks. Um, but the really big boost was using the uh, floating point hardware rather than emulating floating point software. Um, and that took us down to 8,000 clocks. Now, since we were using floats and not doubles, um, bringing in the double precision hardware had absolutely no impact. And so this, we built one reference platform, ran these different compiles, and we could see clearly the, the processor we wanted to run this on was an RV32 IMF. So uh, another example, our stop on instruction function, um, that we just ran uh, fully. And so running it on an RV32E, um, 4,300 clocks, and uh, extending it to the I, we got uh, saved a few hundred clocks down to 4,000. And I didn't think there were any multipliers in there, but maybe on computing some offsets, uh, GCC threw a few in. So we did see um, a few clock, uh, about 100 clocks, 150 clock reduction, bringing in the multiplier, but uh, absolutely no benefit for bringing in the floating point. So total of 10% improvement um, going to an RV32 IM. Um, but we ended up selecting the RV32E um, because if you look at the area, we actually synthesized these out, placed and routed them. Um, you almost double the area uh, from you know, 3,000 square micro, 3,700 square microns up to 5,000 going from the E to the I. So it's a, it's a big boost in area for a very small boost in performance. Um, following an, Anand Argarwal's uh, kill rule, uh, you want to be using the RV32E. Now, the, the question is, that comes up is, is a thread processor really practical? Can you take that one processor and replace it with, you know, in a realistic design, this is going to be 20 or 30 CPUs. 
Um, and the thread processors are typically going to be able to be an RV32i or even an RV32e. And these are in the neighborhood of 10,000 to 20,000 gates. If we throw on the floating point multiplier, uh, it's up around 50,000 gate equivalents. If we look at the application processors, these are usually in the 400,000 to 600,000 gate equivalent range, typically more. And I am including the area for caches because in order to get performance that those processors get, you do need to bring in those caches. So it's actually, in terms of area, you can fit 20 to 40 of these thread processors where you would have a single core um, application processor. And if we look at our computation per gate, um, large cores, as, as you look at these more and more complicated cores, the boom cores, things that are doing, um, that have lots of pipeline stages, that have multiple execution units, that have gone superscalar, these are gonna run at higher frequencies. And they're also going to be able to um, perform more instructions per clock. And, and we can look at these as measured by core mark per megahertz, which you'll be able to find in a lot of, um, uh, a lot of uh, re reference documents. Um, so from the smallest processor to the biggest processor, you're probably gonna get about, you know, maybe a 4X, uh, probably closer to three, in terms of increases in core marks per megahertz, right? You've got to have a really beefy processor that goes over about six core marks per megahertz. And even our IBEX was getting two core marks per megahertz. Um, and then if we look at the Fmax or the maximum frequency that we can run uh, from the smallest, simplest ones to the ones with lots of pipeline stages, you know, typically you're not going to see much more than about a 4X there. So in terms of increased compute capability, you're looking at maybe a six factor of 16 between the smallest, simplest processor to the biggest, beefiest one. Although I did see some announcements for really big, beefy processors last week where somebody had a six gigahertz that ran 1100 spec marks per watt, core marks per watt. Um, so things, things are getting really big and complicated. But you know, if you look at the increase from a 15K gate equivalent to the large application processors, which are ranging in the you know, four to six million gate equivalents, you've got a three to 400 X improvement in, in increase in area for just a 16 X improvement in, um, in, in compute capability. So there's a really big diminishing return on throwing more and more hardware at single threaded execution uh, capability. The bottom line is, these small processors are much more area and energy efficient. So we actually built um, several of these configurations. Um, and so um, we did not build, I, I intended to build uh, sort of the traditional one with one big CPU and put all of the software on it. And unfortunately couldn't find an appropriate candidate that had all the RTL that I could configure and get through synthesis. So, uh, didn't end up building the superscalar big one. But looking through the, the literature and, and uh, papers that other folks have published, um, the processor that would, that would run all of these threads and give us um, a reasonable response time and determinism is probably in the four to five million gate equivalent range and would probably on the 12 nanometer ASIC library we're targeting be in the range of 45 to 50 uh, milliwatts. Um, but at the same time, I didn't build those, so that's kind of a guess. If somebody really wants to quibble with those, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Um, when we built one thread processor per task, um, our area was uh, 1,239,000 um, uh, gate equivalents. And uh, we actually did power analysis on this running uh, all of the different uh, threads and our total power consumption was 10 and three quarters milliwatts. And we had to clock this at 750 megahertz to meet the 50 millisecond timing requirement. Um, when we brought in multiple thread processors to work on the inferencing, um, using simpler processors there, we were able to get down to just under a billion gate equivalents. Um, the power dropped down uh, almost in half to five and a half milliwatts 
And this was primarily uh, a little bit due to the decrease in area. We also had a simplification of all our interconnects and we, we saved a bunch of area there as well. Um, and we got down to 405 megahertz. So the big power savings here is a combination of the drop in area and the drop in frequency. When we brought in our hardware accelerator, uh, the total area dropped down even further. We got this down to about 600,000 gate equivalents, about half the size of our biggest implementation. Our power dropped down to 2.3 milliwatts, and our frequency was able to drop down to 177 megahertz. So it's, it's not only practical to break the tasks up into individual threads, it actually gives you a pretty significant benefit on both uh, area, uh, as well as power consumption and the clock rate that you need to run, about, run on. Now, one of the other questions that I often get asked when talking about this with colleagues is, well, what if I have a system that really needs threads to be added to it? Um, uh, and there are systems that simply need threads, uh, need to be able to dynamically create new threads in order to perform their functions. So one thing you could do is you could create, uh, take an application processor, and make it one of the thread processors. And you, you could even run Linux on it. Um, and that could be run in the context of a bunch of other thread processors that we're doing all your real time processing. Um, and of course, there are systems like you know, a smartphone that simply all of their processing is really wrapped around the notion of, um, of, of creating new threads. And there, you know, this whole notion of uh, creating um, a system where you can't create new threads just doesn't work at all. And so this is an approach for every system, but it is it an approach where you know what your threads are gonna be up front? Um, it makes a lot of sense. So, you know, if we kind of look at the history of computing, um, one of the things we see is that uh, back in the early days, you, it, it, it the ability to build a processor was quite an achievement. And getting one processor uh, in a chip uh, was all anyone could really think of. And so it made sense to add a bunch of complexity that would present the illusion that each thread or each process owned the entire CPU. And that made programming it quite a bit more tractable and enabled us uh, to do a lot of things in the compute space that just wouldn't be possible without uh, that illusion and all of the underlying complexity in both the hardware and software stacks to support that. Uh, thread processors kind of turn that on its head and say, rather than having the illusion that you have your own processor, why not just have your own processor? Today, we have enough silicon to create as many processors as we want. In fact, we're living in the age of dark silicon. Now specifically, that is, we can create a, a, a chip that has so many transistors on it, and those transistors can switch so quickly, that if we were to switch all of the transistors in a sustained manner, we would melt the device. We simply couldn't dissipate the heat fast enough to keep it cool. And so in order to support that, uh, when building large chips today, we have to turn off regions or make regions of silicon go dark in order to be able to you know, build these larger chips. Well, if we have each process on its own processor, when that thread's not active, we can simply turn off that silicon. So it works very nicely with the notion of, of uh, dark silicon. Um, we, we no longer need this illusion uh, and all of the complexity that goes with it. Um, and so with thread processors, the, the, the classic difficulties that you have in putting together a system based on a single processor time slicing threads across one CPU um, of figuring out what's my interrupt latency, what's my worst case response time, how do I prioritize these different tasks? What if I run into priority inversions? Um, the ability to build and more importantly verify that system and ensure it's correct is really hard. And thread processors makes 
all of that complication just melt away. And, and what's really notable here is that uh, this notion of a thread processor becomes even more practical by the fact that the RISC-V processors are so modular, right? We can include or exclude multiply instructions or divide instructions or floating point instructions, vector instructions or not. It becomes very easy to scale up and down that processor to meet the very specific needs of the task that you're going to be running on. So you can include exactly what you need and exclude everything else. And also very important on this is the interconnect between all of your devices, between all the elements on your system, um, becomes much simpler and you have a much higher effective bandwidth with a much smaller area. And you know, sort of if you look at the increase in complexity in processors, um, the same thing has been happening with bus interconnects as we've gone from very simple buses between processors and memories um, you know, to cache coherent um, you know, multiple lane uh, interconnect systems with AXI4 and AXI5 and tile link and network on chip and things like that. These just become bigger and bigger, more and more complicated and, and indeed even more error prone and harder to determine exactly what is my performance gonna be. Um, whereas simplifying it down eliminates many of those problems. So uh, thread processors, an interesting concept, and um, we've actually built a system based on it that seems to work pretty well. So um, I think I'm about at the end of my time. I'd like to thank all of you for your uh, attention and, um, and time today. And, um, and I think Colin and I are happy to take any questions or comments you might have. Thanks, Ross. We have a few questions. Uh, Hello, <laughs> yes. Uh, I have a question. My name is Kashif. And uh, I wanted to ask that uh, how do you see the future direction of uh, the processor and the computing design? Do you see that uh, there will be more and more thread? It's going more and more like a thread processor direction and the uh, regular or processor would like keep on shrinking somehow in its role or is it like uh, just uh, uh, it's going to continue like as it is now? Well, I, I, I think there's the potential of, of processors, you know, becoming simpler and being able to be deployed in, in an array of, of, of computational capability as we've described with the thread processor here. But I think there's, there's enough demand in the general purpose computing space and in devices like smartphones um, where the traditional multi-threaded model is absolutely essential and needs to be continued to be refined and, and enhanced and uh, you know, it, 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 um, the performance improved. I, I think there's always going to be a demand for increasing the single thread performance uh, within the context of a multi-threaded CPU with a multi-user operating system like Linux or Android. So I don't think that's ever going to go away. And I think there's the, the commercial demands behind that are just too great. That's going to continue on. Um, but I think people who are building embedded systems um, could potentially go in this direction. And actually, if you look at the IBEX core, which was the low-end core that we used in this case, uh, it still has a lot of vestiges of the multiprocessing capability. I think it could be um, reduced even more significantly. I, I think it might be able to be cut in half in terms of area uh, from the RV32E that we've got. Um, because you think about PC relative addressing uh, could go out the window. You don't need that addressing mode anymore if you're never relocating code. Um, I, I think RISC-V is just going to um, uh, uh, increase the diversity of processors that we have and the types of tasks that they can, that they can approach. Um, so I don't see this replacing um, the multi-threaded model at all. It's just a different approach. Um, and I, I think it'd be neat if somebody uh, in academia picked this up and, uh, and, and perhaps ran with it. Um, and, and I'll continue to do some more on it. Yeah, just a quick question here is that uh, 
let's say during next two to three years, uh, how do you see that uh, it's developing? Like, is it going to take some percentages of market share in the real world, or is it going to be just uh, some kind uh, of academic I, I, exercise? Just I, uh, I, like wild guess or approximation. Yeah, I I think um, you know as this is something that uh, Colin and I talked about over beers in Germany one day. Um, I think it'll remain uh, kind of an academic curiosity for uh, the next couple of years. Um, I, I think there's merit in it, so I think it's worthy of people considering as they look at architecting, um, especially deeply embedded systems, real-time systems. Um, but to imagine that it's going to take significant market get share from, you know, ARMS, M-class, Joggernut, uh, that's, uh, it's probably not going to happen. I'd, I'd be pleased if it did, but I don't think it will. Well, so we have some questions which were put on the chat earlier, like I requested. Um, okay. We can take a very quick look at those. We've got about two minutes or something like that. Um, I'll, I'll go through them very quickly rather than you having to read them. One of them is uh, how would synchronization between TPs look? Uh, my answer to that is just like it does in an Artos. You'd use uh, um, semaphores and so forth to, to communicate between the, 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 the TPs just like we would between threads. I don't Indeed, think there'd, there'd be some shared memory that all of the thread processors could get at, to, could get at and that's where you'd have semaphores and, and uh, shared communication space. But, but using the same with... facilities that you've got today is exactly what you'd want to do. You could have a system with no shared memory and only use the um, Altos synchronization and things like queues and so forth to communicate between them. So yep. that brings up an, another question is what about security issues um, when the shared memory, um, how will we deal with that? Well, I know you're interested in, in security in the longer term. How can this help with that? But actually two TPs having completely separate memories is a big step in the right direction. But, building a secure system, so. Um. Yeah, I, I actually think that you could create a, a secure thread processor where the code space and the data space were air-gapped. And, and so there would ab be absolutely no possibility of data ever entering the execution path. And with risk five, actually, it's not that hard to go create. Um, it'd be a, a very small modification to the CPU. Um, and there, um, you could simply isolate that memory from the other thread processors and it would be, I, I mean, without being able to deposit electrons into the silicon, there would be no way to change the state of that memory. So I actually think, and, and this is probably next year's talk, I think a secure thread processor um, it could, be, could be far simpler and far more robust than uh, the current security approaches that are being used. Um, the, the current security methods rely on a lot of things working right. And when you have complicated things, they don't always work right. And yeah, your systems tend to be yeah. more complex, not less. So that's, that's uh, really not helping. Indeed. Um, another, another question, which I don't think we should go into in detail, is uh, what would the design environment look like? I think that's a a bigger subject that you and I will probably be chatting about uh, in the months to come because it's uh, um, it would be very much a collaboration between hardware and software guys to build a system using TPs. Um, and there's no bad thing if, uh, if we talk to one another like you and I do, Russ. Yeah, in indeed. Um, somebody mentioned the, the question of could you add dynamically add new thread processors and, and, and no, uh, or at least in as, as we've imagined it so far, um, really, you're, you're, you're stuck with the fixed set of thread processors that you've got. Although in an FPGA space, it might be something interesting, but as defined now, it's set them up and, and, and run with it. Which I think is one of the strengths of this architecture because it, um, it gives you that security and safety and everything, which as soon as you introduce the dynamic creation in an FPGA, you're almost getting back to the complexity of what we do now. Indeed, yep. Don't want to think about that too much. I think we've just, oh, there was a question about WCET analysis. WCET. Worst case execution time. Uh, oh, yeah. So worst case execution um, becomes much simpler to analyze, right? Because you're simply going to take the one thread that represents the, the thing that you want to understand the worst case on. And no other uh, threads can possibly impact it. 
So, you know, in, in the traditional analysis, it's really hard because you have to take all your threads and your operating system into account, figure out what is the worst case thing that could happen. Here, the worst case is much easier to, 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 to figure out and to ascertain. Colin, comments? No, I, I agree with everything you just said. If it, we, we make that whole area much a whole area of activity much simpler. Um, just like I said about debugging and so forth, uh, the potential for making debugging simpler and um, more effective because uh, we, we get away with the um, intrusion and so forth. So yes, that's a good point. I believe we are running out of time now. I think our time slot finished. All right, um, uh, people uh, feel free to email us questions uh, that come up later on. Uh, happy to have a discussion with anyone on this, uh, on this whole topic. Yeah, likewise. So thanks for showing up, everyone. Thanks for your questions. And uh, so do Have get a good in touch. Day. Okay. Bye then.